Hello and welcome to this episode of Psych Boost. In this video, we're going to be looking at cognitive psychology as an approach. We'll define key aspects of cognitive psychology, such as its use of theoretical computer models. We'll learn some new specialist terminology, such as schema and inference, and learn definitions of them. And we'll also look at ways we can evaluate the cognitive approach to psychology. So I'm going to go through some of the key ideas of cognitive psychology, Two. and then I'll go into each of them Three. in a little bit more depth afterwards. So a key principle for cognitive psychologists is the idea that behaviour is a result of information processing. Thoughts can be both conscious and non-conscious, and these thoughts will pass through certain stages, and these stages are what's called internal mental processes. Now one analogy that cognitive psychologists like to use is the idea that the brain is very similar to a computer. So just as a computer processes information and puts it on display, your brain processes information and then that results in outputs like movement and speech. So one thing we'll look at in some depth in cognitive psychology is the use of models. A model is made about the structure of internal mental processes. And once this model is constructed, we can think up testable theories and run experiments to see if each of the aspects of the mental process acts as we would expect it to. We're also going to talk about schemas. Cognitive psychologists suggest that as we develop, we build up mental shortcuts, packages of information that help us navigate the world more easily. And a schema are a collection of experiences about objects, people or situations. And it helps us expect certain types of behaviour from those objects again in the future. So for example, a chair. If you see a chair, you just sit down. If every time you saw a slightly different chair, you had to reconsider what the purpose of that chair was. It would certainly slow down our action through life. Another term we're going to need to know is called inference. Cognitive psychologists are interested in internal mental processes, and in particular the structure of internal mental processes. But these can't be directly observed. You can measure brain activity directly, you can measure behaviours directly. But what an inference is, is to go beyond the immediate evidence. So you go beyond just the behaviour that you've observed in your experiment, and you make an assumption based on that behaviour about how the mental process works. And we'll go into some depth on this in a few minutes. And finally, we need to talk about how Cognitive science and biological processes can be put together and integrated into an area of psychology called cognitive neuroscience. This is an attempt to show how the physical object of the brain works in order to create our mental processes and our mental experience of lived life. So first let's talk about models in cognitive psychology. The first type of model I want to talk about is a computer model. Now this is quite simple and I mentioned it on the previous slide. We see the mind-brain system as similar to that of a computer. So in a computer, you've got a little piece called the central processing unit. This is where most of the calculations and processing is done inside the computer. And we could say this is similar to the function of the brain. Now the brain has inputs, so you have inputs from your senses. And what the brain needs to do is it needs to turn those quite strange sensations, such as light, sound, touch, taste, into a certain code, into a different format, so it can understand the world. So it needs to turn these sensations into thoughts. This is similar to how a computer uses coding language in order to run its various programs. Now a computer has got hard drives for memory storage, and in the same way certain areas of the brain seem to be specialist memory areas. A computer has output, so the computer might make noises, it might run a printer, and it will have a display as well. In the same way the brain has outputs. Brain outputs through behavioural responses. And that's the idea behind the computer model. A theoretical model is slightly more in-depth. Theoretical models are flowcharts and very similar to the flowcharts used in computer programming. They represent how information flows and is processed throughout a mental system. So you can take, for example, memory or attention. Now, by creating these models, we can then test each different aspect of the model for experimentation. And if the behaviour matches up to what we predict from our model, we might suggest our model is a good representation of what's really going on inside the mind. Now on the slide I've got a picture of the multi-store model of memory. This is a model of memory we'll need to look at when we go into the memory unit, so it's worthwhile introducing it now. You can see we've got three squares. One square represents sensory memory. This is memory of your sense impressions from eyes and ears. And as you can see from the diagram, most of this information is lost. Some of the information, if you pay attention to it, moves into short-term memory. But again, much of this information is lost. If we repeat the things that are in our short-term memory, they'll go into long-term memory. Information is lost from long-term memory as well, but it can be retrieved back into short-term memory. So you should be able to see from your own experience about your own memory how this flowchart ties together. Next up we're going to talk about schema. So a schema is a, is a framework we put together based on previous experience, and what these frameworks do is they help us go through life easier than we could do without them. 
There's a large amount of information that we need to have in order to understand the world, and the schema organizes this large amount of information for us. So we might, for example, have a schema which represents a chair, and we know what a chair is for, we can sit on it, we can also put our weight, and generally we'll sit on a chair in the same way. Now if we see a new type of chair, maybe designed in a slightly different way, what we'll do is we'll add this information to our original idea about what a chair is. So if we see this brown chair, we now still accept it as a chair, it still functions in the same way. We've just added this information to our current conception of chair. The same with the red chair, and the same with this kind of rib chair. They all function in pretty much the same way. So adding this information onto a previously existing schema is called assimilation. Sometimes though we come across an object which is slightly more unusual, which maybe doesn't act in the way that our previous schema suggested. If we sat in this final curved chair, we might find it would rock from side to side. So then we would have to adapt our old schema about what a chair really is, or maybe create a new schema, such as the schema of rocking chair. Now these ideas between assimilation and accommodation seem quite complex, just make sure that you're familiar with the idea of what, what a schema is. Now these ideas behind assimilation and accommodation are quite advanced, so they do seem quite confusing. Just make sure you're very familiar with the idea of, of what a schema is. The use of the term schema in cognitive psychology comes from Piaget. He first used this term in psychology and suggested that as children, we develop and acquire a new schema through our interaction with the world and others. So we would learn about chairs through the interaction of different chairs, but the same with other interactions like schemas behind how to behave in school or schemas about how to interact with your peers. There are different types of schemas. We can have self schemas, so mental shortcuts about the ways that we view ourselves. We can have role schemas, so we have mental shortcuts about how perhaps a teacher should behave, or how a doctor should behave, or a taxi driver. And we have schemas called event schemas, which are schemas about situations. So we know that there's a certain schema about what a library is meant to be like, what a nightclub is meant to be like, and the behaviour that goes within that. So just to repeat, schemas allow us to make mental shortcuts through the world, which is really valuable when everything's so complex. And most of the time these schemas are correct. But as you might imagine, these ideas about mental shortcuts, about how certain people behave, or how certain groups of people behave, or how objects work in the world, they can often lead us to incorrect assumptions. They can lead us to stereotyping people. They can lead us to prejudice. They can lead us to be biased. So here's a picture, uh, hot dogs or legs. Now I'm fairly sure that this picture is a picture of hot dogs. But everything else about the picture leads us into a mental shortcut to try and assume that these may be our legs. So just an example of how our mental schemas could lead us into error. Okay, so so far we've talked about models and we've talked about schema. Another key idea from cognitive psychology is the concept of an inference. Now we can't see internal mental processes directly. All we can observe is the behaviour. We have to make an assumption based on that behaviour about the true nature of the internal mental processes. And we could be wrong. But the process is to make repeated observations of behaviour as a result of a stimulus, and then to go beyond that immediate evidence to make an assumption about that underlying mental process. So we might infer that processing one piece of information might be more difficult than processing a different piece of information. We would make that inference based on a measurement. So the measurement might be, say, the time taken to solve the problem with different conditions. So let's have a look at this in the context of two different studies we look at in the memory unit. So the first study is by a researcher called Jacobs. Jacobs gave participants a list of either numbers or letters. The lengths of these lists were increased until the participants just weren't able to recall the numbers or letters accurately in the correct order. And Jacobs found that the participants could recall on average nine numbers and seven letters. So from this, we can see straight away that there certainly aren't many numbers or letters that can be remembered in one go, and there seems to be a slightly higher, and there seems to be slightly more memory for numbers than there are for letters. And then let's look at another piece of research. This is by Barrick. Barrick looked at participants between the ages of 17 and 74 years old. These participants were shown photographs containing some ex-school friends, and they were asked to identify the photographs. So amongst his findings was that after about 15 years, recall was about 90%, but after 48 years, recall was 70%. So what might we be able to say? based on these two studies. What inferences can we make based on the behaviour that was observed? Well, we might be able to say some of these things. Some memories are stored in a short-term way with a small capacity, and some memories are long-term with a large capacity. So we could see the memories of the numbers and letters from Jacobs was quite short, 
and not many pieces of information could be held. Whereas in Barrick's study, the memories were retained over a long time, and clearly there was a large capacity for a large number of faces. We could say, based just on Jacob's study, that maybe numbers and letters are processed differently in the mind, because we can call more numbers than we can letters. And we might say, just in the context of Barrick's study, that long-term memory duration is very long, but we might say that information is still lost from long-term memory. Our final main idea from cognitive psychology is the area of cognitive neuroscience. So cognitive neuroscience is an investigation of how cognition, our thought processes, is produced by this interaction of a range of neural mechanisms we look at in biopsych. So various aspects of brain structure and brain chemistry. Now the tool that's used is functional neuroimaging. This is functional MRIs or PET scans. These are scanning techniques that show the brain activity as it happens. So someone can be completing a task and as they're completing the task, the scientists can see which areas of the brain light up, which would indicate that those areas of the brain are responsible in processing that information. It's not just functional neuroimaging that's used. Cognitive neuroscientists would also use case studies. So we might have, for example, brain damaged patients. These brain damaged patients could have cognitive deficits, such as problems with memory, but we compare them to healthy brains. And these are really useful in showing how some aspects of cognition are separate. And we look at this in some detail in the biopsych unit when we look at localization of function in the brain. So by using these techniques, we can create a map of the brain. And these maps show localized function for areas such as memory, language, and a range of individual tasks. We can use the ideas that we get from cognitive neuroscience when we look at memory, we look at aging, we look at psychopathologies like OCD, dementia, depression, and language formation. And then from this knowledge, we can then develop treatments in order to help people who are suffering. The findings from cognitive neuroscience is also used in the development of artificial minds, such as the development of AI. And this can go on to computers that can recognize images and produce language themselves. So just a brief look at how cognitive psychology links up with some of the issues and debates. Cognitive psychology is a soft determinist approach. So first in the determinism debate, cognitive psychologists suggest soft determinism. So they say that even though thoughts are influenced by previous experience, so schemas and brain structure, we do have conscious thought and these conscious thoughts can override the influence of these schemas and brain structure. Now the use of comparing the brain to a computer is criticized by some psychologists as being overly mechanical and a term we can use as machine reductionist. So it reduces humans down to the level of some machines. And cognitive psychology, it's true, doesn't really explain the role of human irrationality in the way that computers aren't irrational, and also don't fully explain the role of emotions. In the nature-nurture debate, cognitive psychologists accept that there is an inheritance of you know, your general brain structure, and this does lead to the development of shared mental processes. But of course, the development of schema is down to experience within the environment. So there is a balance really between nature and nurture effects. Now, generally, cognitive psychologists' approach would be to use large-scale experiments and then use the results of these experiments to make general rules for human behavior. So we would say that cognitive psychology is nomothetic. But while said that, cognitive psychologists do use case studies of unusual people with extreme brain injuries, and then from their experiences make suggestions about how the structure of mental processes work. But then these are usually followed on later by large-scale experiments. So how could we evaluate cognitive psychology? Well, we can definitely make the argument that some of the experiments used by cognitive psychologists don't demonstrate everyday uses of mental processes such as memory. The experimental tasks are generally quite artificial. And while it might show us how memory works in these particular situations, it doesn't show us how it works in day-to-day -day life. So you might suggest that cognitive psychology experiments lack generalizability. And the use of inference we might suggest it's somewhat unscientific because we can't directly test these internal mental processes. We have to assume that they're on the basis of our observations. But having said that, we could say that cognitive psychology does have a high level of control within its research. And we can generally trust that cognitive psychology experiments are well run. And the use of the models have really helped us understand how mental processes such as memory works and has led to the development of cognitive neuroscience. Another downside of cognitive psychology is generally cognitive psychologists will break down mental processes into memory, attention, vision, 
but they won't often talk about how these processes work together. Also, as internal mental processes are what cognitive psychologists look at, quite often they rely on self-report, and we might suggest that people responding to self-reports might be somewhat biased. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a like. If you haven't already, click subscribe to be updated with new videos. And also, if you have any questions about the content covered during this video, please drop a, a comment in the comments below. If you see a question and you think you can answer it, then please give that a go as well. Thank you very much. Until the next episode of Psych Boost.